with some French guy. Uh, huh? What's that? No, 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 much lower. It's the elementary formula that if you have a vector, you high alpha. If you have a vector, you expand it. I mean, you take the inner product with an orthonormal basis, and then you sum. No, no, no. It's the uh, I, I described it when I when I made the this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's it's uh, anyway. It's an, the elementary formula for an orthonormal basis. So instead of the orthonormal basis, you can use a ribbon basis. You must just divide by a number. Yeah, that was very useful. So just take the inner products and sum sum the corresponding vectors, which are the roots, with that number. So it's what happens when you break the space into pieces. That's the, that's on the blackboard. Oh, from the back of the room, it looks like a chemical chart. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, it is almost. It's the uh, it's the pieces in five coordinates that you get when you when you cut the space to make uh, the higher the higher uh, Gelfand settling. The high analog of the Gelfand settling. So these are the pieces of space that appear. So at the bottom, there are all of them, which are about uh, 20 or so. And uh, if you go to, uh, to eight coordinates, I think that at the bottom you would have about uh, uh, 80,000 different kinds of shards. So these are. These are the planes which appear in representation theory. You just cut the space with them. So that's what I'd like to use a supercomputer for, to make this for nine coordinates. So the structure of this is, uh, is not uh, really known. But uh, that's a little bit, I mean, that's, that's how much I understand, at least, from the structures in that legend on the right-hand side. And then there's a, uh, here, so you see that this grows super exponentially. This is for uh, 3D, this piece here. Sruthi, may I, may I, uh, Ask you, they are, they are in the office of Arthur, there are two shopping bags oh. with plastic models, because one of them was this one for this, yes. So here, this is for the plane. You see this one here on the left? This is for the plane. It's one triangle standing up and one triangle standing down. That's for the usual intertwiners. Yeah, so. You divide the space, one triangle standing up, one triangle standing down. Do you see this is a triangle standing up, and this is a triangle standing down. Yes? And there is one kind of edge and one kind of vertex. So this is in three coordinates. Hmm? Yeah, the vertices are spanned by permutations of 0, 0, 1 in coordinates with same sum. So they are, an, uh, OK, we'll go to that some other time, because we have to start. So this was just a, a warm up. Here they are on the actual, on the actual uh, model. In, in four, four D, I mean in four coordinates in three D. So this is how they construct the Okay. So we should uh well, these are still I think there was another just a bit and then I yes it was Yeah? They're not there. Oh. They are, they are not in Arthur's office? No. It's okay. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll find them, no problem. Okay, so we should, uh, we should start. Let me uh, put this on mute and lift. And I think we have to lower the shades. Okay, so what I'd like to, uh, to do today is um, show the passage to uh, the higher theory, uh, speak a bit about SL3. So as you saw before, uh, if you build, uh, oh, thank you, Zhang Wei. Ah, they were there, but they were well hidden. Uh, thank you, thank you. Oh, th thank you very much. Really, we'll, we'll have uh, we use these, hopefully. So, uh, as you have seen from the ribbon, actually, um, that we built, which in essence contains all of the usual representation theory, we did only a part of that, but. Uh, uh, when used in a more advanced way with essential path. And so one can construct for that uh, representations and universal enveloping algebra and everything on the ribbon itself. So, uh, and as you have seen, the functioning of the ribbon is basically based on uh, tensoring irreducibles of SU2. Yes, it's some root of unity. So. Uh, it means that our usual mathematics is entirely based on SU2. Yes, the quaternions which were found a uh, century and a half ago by uh, Hamilton. And uh, the idea now is to build some new math which is based on uh, uh, anything else on any other simple or semi-simple uh, Lie algebra. So in particular, if we do the mathematics over SL3 and SL4, this should be uh, viewed as the higher versions of the usual one. And the advantages, uh, I mean, one of the goals of this, besides the interest in itself, is that, um, as I was saying, in quantum field theory, mathematics says to fill the space. We'll discuss this more if you come, if you want to come to the box center, I think today, right after the lecture, you can ask questions and we can have an informal discussion on that. Uh, so, uh, so it's not just a matter of making uh, higher math, which would be again, in this context, math of SL3, SL4, and so on, but making a different kind of math altogether. And here's what we need to know about, uh, about uh, SL, SL3. And let me, I do remember that I, I need something which I'll find uh, uh, very soon, which is, uh, Yes. Now, so here's we we work with SL three, and uh, let's start a little bit with the uh, with uh, its own crystallography. Now, its crystallography, we have made it in a way we have built the necessary crystallography with a ribbon, because we can build SL3, SL4, and so on out of the Coxeter diagram on the ribbon. We have roots and weights, simple roots and all that. But let me remind you that SL3, uh, for SL3, you take uh, here 
these would be roots of SL3, simple roots. And we should put here the affine root. So maybe we'll put here two arrows, the affine root. The link in the corresponding diagram was A2, and we had uh, an affine vertex here. So as you see, it, it must have angles 120 degrees with the others, right? Which is what you see here. Then the uh, uh, fundamental weights Now, for the fundamental weights, they must be, so the length of these roots is a square root of two here. And uh, the weights should have, uh, should be the linear dual of this, which means that they have inner product one with one of them and zero with the other. So these should be then the roots, the fundamental See, they're on a line here, so if you make triangles like this, then uh, they are the centers of the triangles, so, so the thick things are the fundamental weights. And they have inner product one with the, with the roots. Uh, let me... Uh, remind you also a little bit uh, uh, how these appear on the ribbon. So since we have the ribbon, why not use it? The ribbon in this case is uh, something like uh, this. So this is a ribbon. For A2. This is a graph A2 product with, uh, so this, this is N, which is Coxeter. That's not right, it is N, Coxeter equal to three, which is two plus one. And uh, so these are the six roots. And uh, the corresponding uh, fundamental weights come by fusion. So if we have, remember that the, this root, and uh, so this is, let's say, on level one, well, let's take the, the, the top one here, which is on level zero, let's say, and then we take n minus one, which is two lower. So these are the simple roots. Yes, the, these two. In this case, and uh, we should write also a fundamental weight, which was fusion from any of them. So we can start from here upwards or from here downwards. So let's start from here upwards. This would be one, one, zero, zero, negative one, negative one. This is a fundamental weight. These are the positive roots, and this is uh, the uh, biggest root, it's called. And it's a negative of the affine root. It has the biggest coefficients of all. And the coefficients are exactly the coefficients from the affine one, which are one, one, one. So this is the biggest root. What happens if you sum these with these coefficients that you find here? Can you see fast? 
Yes, yes. One plus one plus one. You sum these three things. What do you get? Yes. Zero, yes. So this is this sum is zero. So that's a degenerate part if you'd like to make an inner product on with which is three dimensional. Yes? Define these coefficients, which were the Perron Frobenius, give you the, uh, the uh, a sum, which is zero, yes? And since they would have here one uh, for the affine root, yes, it means that the, the uh, um, well, uh, so uh, it expresses this way the affine root in terms of the others if you change the signs. Uh, one more thing, the uh, place where the affine root is connected these form the these form the uh, the uh, um, adjoint representation, which is SL three on itself, acting on itself. Yes. So this would be. Uh, let me mention here what are these then so let's let's go now to representations you'll see uh, I think I went uh, bad ahead so let's take the two representations the two fundamental representations uh, the representations were these and that yes so these are the fundamental representations, and we'll draw them like this now, downwards. And uh, this will be the trivial representation. We'll put this is a trivial representation. And these should be the familiar representations uh, for, uh, for uh, SL3, namely, the three-dimensional here, V. So let's put here one dot and here two vertical dots. So one dot is V, which is C to the three, yes, which is acted upon by, of course, by SL3. And two dots is V to the wedge two and uh, which is also isomorphic to V bar, the conjugate of V. So this has basis EI, this has basis EI wedge EJ, where I is different from, I is less than J. And uh, if you go here to the complement EK with a sign. This is a Hodge duality, the Hodge complement. And uh, so this identifies uh, V wedge two as uh, V bar. And in physics, this one is called three so this is a physics notation, a three and three bar by physicists. So now we continue to tensor this. So let's not put yet, ar well, we shouldn't put yet arrows, we should put just lines. This is a, a, a lattice actually. So we'll take 
we'll build a triangular lattice like this. So this is a, a positive cone in the, so the, the positive uh, integer span of the fundamental weights. And we'll mark these as follows. Uh, as you see, there are sums of these two, right? So uh, this one would be, so the sum will be here uh, put horizontally as a vector. So this would be this and so on. And the uh, theory of Hermann Weil tells us that uh, tells us that uh, we can obtain that this table here uh, describes all the uh, finite dimensional representations of uh, this uh, particular SLN. Also, by exponentiations, uh, the, we can build this way all the representations of SU3. Yes, all the uh, finite dimensional, all the, all the representations of SU3. And I would, I would like to describe to you a bit uh, what happens, they are, uh, we'll need that further on. So this is the positive integer and we have also the weight lattice. Sure. These edges. We, yeah, we'll give them a meaning right away, but we need to orient them uh, in two different ways. That's why I did not uh, yet put arrows on them, and I'll, I'll give them meaning, yes. I mean, the, the sum will have a meaning, because that is generated by this. Yes. So it's, uh, well, it's the same. So what we'll show is that if you tensor, for instance, with this generator, so we can tensor representations. Let's, let's go to that. So these are the arrows of uh, tensoring, not the orientation. Thank you for the question. So yes, so note the orientation here, which is circular. Uh, this one of them is bad, just a bit. This one's going up here. And uh, so they're going the same way for the same direction they're oriented, yes? So this is a graph of dot. So this is, uh, we'll call this sigma dot. And this one is, uh, of course, sigma double dot. And in general, these are called young. So here, as you can see, we have things of this form, a number of single dots and a number of double dots. So these are called young. Diagrams. By the way, if you're familiar with uh, these uh, young things found about 100 years ago, a little bit over 100 years ago, the diagrams have dots. And the, uh, uh, the filled diagrams, the diagrams filled with numbers, which appear in representation theory, are called young tableaus. 
So the idea is that every dot represents what? From what you see already, is just the space V, actually. Uh, wherever it is, this, this one is V wedge V. So the only difference here between vertical and uh, horizontal is that vertically the anti-symmetrized and horizontally things are symmetrized. And uh, so it's a mixture of the two. Now, the graph here is the graph of tensoring with sigma with a single generator, this, this particular graph. Yes, and as you can see, it extends to the whole uh, weight lattice, yes? So the weight lattice is the, the lattice, uh, so uh, fundamental weights with integer coefficients. Now, you can see from here the kind of relation that we'll have, which is one that you can see that if you go in three steps, tensoring with sigma, yes, then you arrive back to the identity, right? So uh, sigma uh, tensor sigma dot tensor sigma dot this contains the identity, and this is why, because this is V tensor V tensor V, and inside it, there is V wedge V, wedge V, the anti-symmetric part, and on this, SL3 acts by determinant, by the, by the determinant, by multiplication with a determinant, which determinant is one, yes? So you can check as an exercise that if you take a wedge vector and you apply the matrix to each of them, then, uh, uh, and this should not be this, but SL, SU3, the unitary form of it acts by determinant, SL3 acts by the trace. So SL3 by trace, which is zero. The way uh, a differential object like SL3 acts is exactly like the Lorentz formula with which you're familiar from calculus. When you take a derivative of this, you, you take the differential of every, turn, of every term in turn, and then you add the results, yes? So that's what you do here with, uh, with uh, SLN. Now, um, Let's do a graphical picture for this, and let's put also the fact that sigma and sigma bar are conjugate. So sigma single dot tensor sigma double dot also contains the identity. So uh, let's write here one more thing, that sigma double dot tensor this uses arrows the same arrows backwards. Yes, so I won't redo the, the graph here. So sigma tensor sigma double uh, dot is the identity, so we can, uh, we can put now uh, one here for sigma, a two, for sigma 
this is sigma dot, this is sigma double dot, and this should be the same as the arrow backwards, one. Yes? And our relation written with intertwiners is that three of these enter and, they, and nothing comes out, right? So this is the, uh, so here sigma dot, sigma dot, sigma dot enters and uh, nothing comes out. Okay, now the, uh, <coughs> the representations themselves by the way, whenever we do such a thing so that it doesn't look uh, uh, unfamiliar, we should do the same for uh, SL2, yes? So for SL2, the picture is this, nothing, then, uh, then there's a single dot and there are arrows going back and forth then there, there are double dots, there's a double dot here, yes, and so on. The uh, fine diagram in that case is this one. And it tells you that you get the uh, the uh, adjoint representation twice. Which are the two things, by the way, since I was mentioning here? Can somebody tell me? Uh, the the two, uh, two things which enter into the adjoint representations in elementary math. The adjoint representation is an action on matrices, yes, by conjugation. So one of them is what, and the other is what? As you can see here. Just think, so matrices are made of two vectors, yes? One is, matrices are made of two vectors, right? So these would be rows, and these would be columns. Right, for the, for the n by n matrices. Yes, so you can see now that the rows are a single dot and the columns are a maximal number of dots. Of course, the same thing, we'll use that, um, holds for any uh, SLN. At least, and the vial theory tells you that the same thing holds, for instance, for E8, you have some fundamental weights at every vertex, the dual of the roots, and those are the generating representations, and then you can make something, if you want, like young tableaus, you can just take the fundamental representations and tensor as many as you want, symmetrize them, and you get arbitrary representations. Yes, yeah, so the picture is, uh, is extremely similar. Uh, now, uh, here, we don't have to use a half blob, by the way, because the product of three columns, if you permute three fellows uh, circularly, yes, then the, the first one, in order to go back, jumps over two, right? So it means that the cyclic permutation is even for SL3, so it means that if you permute these cyclically, you get exactly the same, right? For SL2, if you switch two, thing, two people there. Okay, so now uh, let me describe a little bit the representation according to uh, uh, Vire. Now we have described a bit the representation. You remember we were growing some vegetables from, uh, from this, so that was a Gelfand Settling explicit representation. Yes? Uh, I'd like to describe, though, the weights of that. So here is the vial theory. So you take 
Now, so recall that if you have a representation uh, alpha, an irreducible representation of uh, SL3, let's say, that uh, uh, vectors, so the diagonal matrix, diagonal part of SL3 is a billion, so it has eigen vectors and eigenvalues with eigenvalues given by the inner product with some uh, omega where this is called a weight. So these eigenvalues on the diagonal. Diagonal, you view the diagonal as a vector space, and then a linear form on that is the inner product with a vector, right? And this is called the weight. So, uh, and uh, let's take here the, well, the trivial we know, let's take here the one of them, uh, let's take the single dot, and let's see so this is V, and in it you have E1, E2, E3. And if you take, uh, so the diagonal is made of HIJs, so if you take uh, an HIJ, which is EII minus EJJ, yes, if you apply HIJ to E, EK, yes, this is Kronecker of IK minus Kronecker of JK times EK. So EK is an eigenvector and this is the uh, eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue now, this is uh, exactly EK in a product with, uh, I mean, H, let's put here the H in front. This is HIJ in a product with a vector EK. Uh, if we write uh, EI, where now we use a different convention, this would be EI minus EJ. So it's a slight change of notation. We maybe should use a, a different, uh, and, uh, but we'll keep this slight notation. And uh, the problem is that this, the, the, these have some of coefs, coefficients is zero for the HIJs. So these are diagonal elements, yes? And uh, now let's put actually on the diagonal without changing the notation, let's put here EKK. But EKK does not have the sum of coefficient zero, so this is HIJ in a with, uh, and now how do you write this? You, you need the projection of this onto, onto, the, onto the sum zero, so it's EKK minus one third the sum of EMM. Yes, and this is a weight of EK. So the three weights are the following, they would be uh, the first one would be, so the, uh, one of them is exactly in this cone, 
And that one is uh, the weight of E1. This is going to be E1 minus one third E1 plus E2 plus E3. And this is uh, two thirds negative one third negative one third. Yes, and the others are permutation of this. So here they are in the plane. This would be E1, E2, E3. And now you can see also the uh, other ones. So these are the weights. of sigma single dot. And now you can also see the weights of sigma double dot, which are, so sigma double dot has vectors E1 where G2 and so on. And E1 where G2 would have as weight the sum of the two weights of E1 and E2, so this would be this. So these are weights of this generator, yes? Now let's do in parallel as we were doing before the weights of, uh, so sig for SL2, we have single sigma dot which are the which is a generator and which has two weights. Going this way. Uh, the roots now are weights of the adjoint representation, which is uh, which is uh, SL, in this case, SL3 acting on itself by conjugation. By commutator differentially. And we leave it, So the roots are weights, they are the non-zero weights of the adjoint representation. So let's, uh, let's do this here now. So these are the fundamental weights, remember? And this would be the, so these are the fundamental weights. And now for this, uh, for the adjoint, we have these which you saw before as roots. Yes, so in particular the dual roots are these two. So these are the roots. And there is one more, so remember, these are the traceless matrices, so they will be three by three, size nine. We have trace zero, which uh, removes one, so it should be eight. Yes, which are where? Two in the middle. So uh, there's also, so the, uh, these are roots, and this one, we here with multiplicity two. This is a weight zero of uh, diagonals, elements, twice. And now we have the eight, the eight uh, weights total 
eight weights of the adjoint representation. So again, for SL2, the weights are the following. If you take the fundamental roots here to be this one and this one, the, the fundamental weights, the, 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 the roots are one, this one and this one, yes? So in physics, these are, uh, so these are the fundamental weights. This is a fundamental weight. There's only one weight. And this is in physics a spin one half. And uh, this is the uh, this is a root, the positive root, which corresponds to the representation of spin one. And uh, now comes the idea. I was trying to see what was this. Uh, how could one build the higher ribbon? Uh, after I saw the ribbon first, I, I think I told you that uh, I was. I decided to give a course on the whole algebra and uh, quivers, and in the middle of it, I switched to the ribbon, harrowing process. I mean, working till I entered every class every day uh, to put up the, stuff, the new stuff. And uh, I was trying then to see what's a high analog of that ribbon. And the main observation was that the, uh, uh, the Z mod 2N, which we used, was actually the weight lattice. So remember that in the case of SL2, we use the graph G times here Z mod 2N. But this was a weight lattice. It's written a little bit small. The weight lattice of SL2. So the idea, weight lattice. So the idea is to use, in this case, the weight lattice of SL3 with the same uh, uh, same uh, role as before. But let me, before that, discuss a few more representations. So you have seen here one, yes? You see, this is the, this is the highest weight of this representation, this one here. And uh, it somehow is supposed to span all the other, uh, the whole representation uh, and encode it. You remember that in the gelfand settlin picture, the highest weight was sending everything to the wall. And then we obtained out of that wall the rest by moving things away from the wall. Yes, so this is the highest weight. And um, the formula, so for Hermann Weyl, so, so again, the theory which we won't do here uh, in any detail except for what we need is that uh, any irre irreducible representation of a simple Lie group has the uh, highest weight which is a linear combination uh, with which is a, a positive positive integer combination of the fundamental weights
So in this case, you see that it's a sum of the two. And it also describes to you how this is generated. Remember, these are the three by three matrices which are traceless, yes? So what did we do? We tensor this with this, yes? Rows with columns. And we took away a copy of the trivial representation. As you can see in this example, you can see, uh, the, there is a, a theory similar to the essential path. Namely, uh, we could take paths, we could, we could uh, take paths made of the generators and then take only in the corresponding tensor product, yes, remove copies, remove things so as to leave only the irreducible. That's a mechanism. Once again here, this is made of going once to the left and once to the right, yes, which would be something like this, but we remove the trivial, yes? So that's exactly what we'll do on the higher ribbon. Use this operation of tensoring the generators, yes, which would mean basically a path in one direction followed by some other path in the second direction and so on. We order these, these uh, simple roots, these simple, these, these fundamental representations in some way. And then we remove out of that previous things. And those, that operation would correspond to the essential path. Now, uh, let me dis try to describe for you, that's important, the, uh, um, the fundamental formula of Weil, which we'll need to use uh, in order to prove things here. So, uh, first of all, uh, a formula for the dimension we'll put now, you'll have to draw it again, I think, Fortunately, I saw that the latest version of uh, programs like Adobe Illustrator allows you to have a grid at 60, at 60 degrees. So you can, uh, you can set your grid and, and draw everything you want. Uh, try to be very accurate when, when you describe it. These, these things are crystallographic. So this now will put, will put things, the previous lattice, in between two mirrors, let's use some dots here. And we'll put here We'll call them the vial mirrors. Which are perpendicular to, so hyperplanes. Perpendicular to roots. And we'll start here with the trivial representation, single dot, double dot. And so on. A distance one from, from these mirrors. <coughs> so again, these here are the fundamental weights. Why would they be on some mirror? Fast. Oh, come on, guys. They are on a, you are on a mirror when you have inner product zero with a root. 
The problem with mirrors uh, that I found when uh, teaching mirrors in uh, linear algebra was that people did not see enough uh, uh, detective movies. You see, what happens when you write something on the mirror? What happens with the writing? It? Nope. If you write on the mirror, it's usually with some lipstick or something, it stays the same, yes? So the mirror is a part that's fixed. And uh, 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 the perpendicular to the mirror is the part that's, that's reflected, yes? So here we are. Uh, these are the fundamental weights, and they're, of course, on mirrors because they have inner product zero with everything except for one. Yes, so they would be on all the mirrors except on one, yes? Among, uh, uh, okay, so now, this is a very important vector here. So this vector is, uh, this vector rho is called the vile vector rho. And is a sum of all, of all fundamental weights. And in my view, I, apparently this is not uh, necessarily uh, shared around, but in my view, I mean, this is exactly the analog of the uh, number one. So it's like which is viewed as a difference between the multiplicative unit minus the additive unit of R or Z. Yeah? It's better in this case of Z rather than of R. So you can see here that you, you have here the, the, the um, trivial representation, so this is the unit for tensoring, yes? So these, here you have tensoring. On the other hand, you'll have these mirrors, and let's look, see a bit what they do. So according to Weil, these mirrors, the formula for the dimension of an EREP with highest weight alpha is equal to the product of the distance of alpha to the above mirrors over the same for the trivial representation. This is known as a vial denominator, and this is a vial numerator. So let's compute here one such example. Uh, this should be which one, which we just did? Oh yes, we should, uh, we should stop in a second. Uh, here, we should, uh, and we'll continue at the box center, but let, let's just uh, not stop before we compute just the, the size of this, which is what distances are there here? Do you see two, three, and two, yes? 
So the dimension of this is 2, 3, 2, divided by the same here, which is 1, 1, and 2. And this is uh, not 2, 3, 2, but it's 2, 4, 2. Do you see this is 1, 2, 3, 4, yes? 2, 4, 2 over 1, 1, 2 for this, yes? And this is 2 times uh, 4. Uh, this holds with quantum numbers, so the, we shouldn't necessarily uh, write it, uh, uh, I mean, take the product here. And this is known in physics as 8, yes? So uh, we'll continue uh, next time and build toward the, uh, the, we're kind of halfway toward defining uh, the uh, ribbon, the higher ribbon, yes? So uh, we'll do then mathematics over SL3. And there's a chance, as I, I haven't yet computed it, but I'll stay here longer. We can continue the discussion in the box center, but there's a chance that this could be the, uh, this could be the math over quaternions. And uh, the other one over sedanions and so on, because it turns out that the fundamental, the SL2 or in these higher cases has uh, uh, powers of two as dimensions and they don't look like they're associative at all. So we'll stop here. Very good.